reading, we'll be reading from 2 Corinthians 7, chapter 7, verses 9 through N10. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Please join me in prayer. Father, thank you for who you are and for all that you've done. And Father, I pray that you would just be pleased to glorify yourself in this service today. The Father, it is your words that are spoken and your message that is received. And the Father, that it is the Holy Spirit that would do a miraculous work in giving a clear message and clear understanding. Help us to honor and glorify you in all that we do and in all that we say. In your precious, gracious, and holy name, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. You may be seated. I was wondering why they were making interesting gestures at me in the back of the room. <laughs> I hadn't turned on my mic, so we were using this one. In, hello, my name is, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm seeing several new faces. Let me get my glasses on so I can actually see people. There we go. Um, I'm seeing quite a few new faces this morning and a lot of old faces that I've known for a while. And so on the newer faces, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Larry, Pastor Larry, and I am the associate pastor over family ministries here at Calvary Baptist Church. And no, I'm not Rick. He was not feeling well again this week. However, in contact with him, he is improving and thinks uh, within a day or two, he'll be back up to par. So... Uh, I'm thinking that he will be back here next week. If I'm up here again, it'll be a surprise to both of us. So, um, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Larry. And as many of you already know, I have been walking us through a sermon series called Pardon My Jargon. Understand, coming to understand the terms and the verbiage that we use in Christian ease and among each other within the church. And so my hope in this uh, sermon today is that we would not only, some of us would discover, while others would rediscover what the scripture actually has to say about these terms or these subjects. In the first message, we, did, we worked with the topic of uh, confession and come to realize that there were two different positions for confession, those who are Christians and those who are not, and that it has three different meanings. We then went on to understand the term sin. In my last time in front of you, we learned that the world has a very different meaning than the scripture does about sin that we also came to understand the types of sin, that there were sins of commission that I intentionally do, there are sins of omission that I intentionally ignore, but that there are also hidden sins. And so then this week, we're going to take a look, an in-depth look at the word repentance and come to understand what the scripture has to tell us about this topic. The instruction to repent has a very heavy connotation to it. For most people, they define it as being remorseful or and, uh, being remorseful and regret. It sounds uncomfortable and dark, but somehow the scripture, in the scripture, it is meant to lead us to something good. We're going to take a look at this. 
since it is a biblical concept, allow me to journey to the Old Testament to call on its Hebrew meaning from here. The Hebrew word for translate uh, that is translated as repentance is the Hebrew word teshuvah. And teshuvah is a lot more than a feeling of guilt or regret. In fact, it's derived from the verb to return. So how does that help us understand the biblical concept of repentance? Our English Bible often mentions repentance, which most interpret as being sorry, as much of it appears to be more of a feeling rather than an, taking an action. We punish ourselves and our thoughts and our feelings which torment our souls. What is more often, the repenting seems to never end. But Teshuvah takes on a completely different focus. Instead of being simply a state of mind, it is a decision. It is deciding to turn away from where we are headed and moving back toward God. A Jewish theologian, Abraham, Abraham Heschel, puts it this way, a change in a man's conduct brings about a change in God's judgment. When we teshuvah, or turn away from sin and turn toward God, then God pulls us toward himself. Joel, Joel 2, verse 12, says, Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart. It is not just an adjusting the course, but completely turning back around, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Teshuvah is more than just stopping a certain behavior or being sorry or apologizing a single time. This is a continuous decision to return to God and to receive a new beginning. In Jewish thought, the purpose of repentance is to go through a transformation. It is not just an apologetic confession. To regret a misdeed is only a step in the process of teshuvah. Joseph and his brothers are a clear example of true teshuvah in the Old Testament. Found in Genesis chapters 37 through 50, we find that Joseph was betrayed, sold into slavery, and abandoned by his brothers. But after many years, God flips the script on these men. Joseph becomes the second most powerful man in Egypt. Meanwhile, his brothers come to Egypt for help due to, a, to hunger and a drought in the land. But they do not recognize Joseph. This veil of mystery allows Joseph to test whether his brothers have changed. Just as they betrayed him, Joseph gives his brothers another opportunity to betray, this time their younger brother, Benjamin. Benjamin is held responsible for a crime while the older brothers are permitted to leave. But this time they pass the test. Decades of grief and remorse make them act differently. The brothers refuse to leave Benjamin behind. And if, you hadn't, if you're familiar with this historical account, Judah even offers his life and freedom in place of Benjamin's. He was the one who offered his brother Joseph up to slavery. And now he's willing to take the place of his younger brother. We can see now his display of courage and maturity and selflessness. 
Joseph is finally ready to reveal the whole truth to his brothers. As seen in this historical account of Joseph and his brothers, the biblical concept of repentance is more than saying, I'm sorry. To repent means to rearrange your entire way of thinking, feeling, and being in order to forsake that which is wrong. Judah and his brothers showed remorse, but more importantly, they showed transformation. Teshuvah is returning to what is right and pure. It is returning to innocence. Aside from showing regret and remorse, it is the returning to the original plan of God. To live with him, consult with him, fellowship with him, and obey him. So essentially, to repent means to recognize our wrongdoing and humbly denying oneself. To turn around and face the one we have wronged. It is regretting our sin and showing remorse, yes. And it is also committing to a new path. Because this return path of correction and truth leads us to true freedom. This gives us a clear understanding of what the Old Testament has to say. But there are some basic truths we need to understand about repentance. For it, is, for it to make any sense, we first need to understand that it's always a good time to repent. And it is never too late. If the Bible teaches us anything about forgiveness, it is that it is always on the table. But it is up to us to reach to it. Secondly, God is always ready to take us back. Like the father of the prodigal son, all the son needed to do was return. To teshavah or to repent, the father was prepared to pour out all of his love regardless of the state of the son. This gives us a clear understanding of the Old Testament understanding of repentance. But we don't leave it there. We need the full counsel of God's word on this issue. And so now we need to move to the New Testament. Where not only are we going to understand what the New Testament has to say about it, but also get a beautiful illustration. At this point, I must also apologize. That apology is the fact that at some points I'm going to start sounding like a counselor instead of a pastor. A role in which I am far more comfortable I am still learning and God is still teaching me how to teach from behind this podium. But I have been counseling for years and using God's word to shine light into lives that are lost. And so we're going to take a look at what the New Testament has to say. So now as we move to the New Testament where it gives us a clear illustration of the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Remember that another word for repent is sorrow. But there are two clear areas that the scripture shows us about that sorrow. Two of the most well-known of the 12 disciples, most believers would say are very different. Judas and Simon Peter. One betrayed Jesus and the other would go on to, one of the most pa to be one of the most passionate apostles. Yet a study of the Gospels reveals an interesting pattern. Judas had a position of trust. Peter was the one who kept losing his temper. Judas failed to understand who Jesus was even to the end. The Holy Spirit gave us insight, gave insight to Peter 
about the true nature of Jesus. On the night of Jesus' trials, Judas betrayed him, but Peter denied him. By comparing these two men, a picture is painted that illustrates godly sorrow as opposed to worldly sorrow. So let's take a deeper look at each one of these individuals and what the scripture has to share with us about them. What does the gospel tell us about Judas? Little can be affirmatively known about the early life of Judas Iscariot. The Gospel of John asserts that he was the son of a man named Simon Iscariot. There is even some debate among scholars as to what Iscariot actually refers to, a region, a Jewish sect, or even a familiar term for liar. The latter two are considered the least likely, but are still a part of the debate. In all four of the Gospels, Judas is mentioned by name as one of the twelve hand-picked apostles. He went out with others, as we find in Mark chapter 6, also recorded in Matthew, to spread the news of Jesus Christ, Mark chapter 6, verses 12 and 13 say, so they went out and proclaimed that people should repent And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed, and they healed them. There is no account in the scripture that tells us that Judas failed at his task. He too did what the rest of the apostles did. The book of John highlights another interesting point about the future betrayer. In John 12, chapter 6, or in John chapter 12, verse 6, John notes that Judas held the apostle's money bag, a position of trust, requiring integrity. While Judas may have had bad motives for holding the, the purse, which we'll discuss more later, while the other apostles did entrust him with their money. Highlighted frequently, particularly in the Gospel of John, is Judas's greed. The sin appears to be one of the one that he struggled with the most and ultimately failed to overcome. John reveals in his Gospel the extent of Judas's love for money. After Mary Magdalene anointed Jesus with precious perfume, John chapter 12, verses 6, 4 through 6 tells us, But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to whatever was put in it, end of quote. Beyond embezzlement, Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Given how much the religious leaders wanted to arrest Jesus, Judas could probably have asked for land. He could have probably asked for political power. He asked for what he truly desired, financial gain. So what does the scripture tell us about Peter? Now when we look at Peter, born Simon, son of Judah, and renamed Peter by the Lord Jesus Christ, this apostle began life as a fisherman in Capernaum. Though it is not known who she was, Peter did have a wife. In all three of the synoptic gospels, it is mentioned that Jesus healed his mother-in-law. His brother Andrew was also an apostle. And they worked with the sons of Zebedee, who were also apostles. Like Judas, Peter is named in all four of the gospel accounts of Jesus' life. And would go on to write two other books in the New Testament. 
Jesus called Peter and his brothers to follow him by getting into Simon's boat, helping them catch fish miraculously, and inviting them to be fishers of men. Here the gospels show, the gospels show that Simon Peter had early insight into who Jesus was. Stating in Luke 5, chapter 5, verse 8, But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Immediately he understood that this miracle worker was more than just an insightful man or even a powerful prophet. Later, Jesus confirms the Holy Spirit is guiding Peter as recorded in Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter was truly dedicated to Jesus, following him like Judas. Peter performed those same miracles when he was sent out, as we see in Mark chapter 6. While Judas struggled with greed, Simon Peter exhibited pride and a quick temper. There are several moments in the Gospels where Peter bodily, boldly claimed he would go to war for Jesus, that he would always do whatever it took for his Lord. That arrogance was so strong that even when Jesus predicted his denial, Peter failed to change his heart. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 33 through 35, it says, Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Later, when they came to take Jesus away, as found in the first part of John chapter 8, verse 10, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant. His instinct was to strike at the first person he saw. Not one of the Roman soldiers, not one of the important members of the religious order, but a servant. He tried to fight as a warrior, but that was the wrong course of action. Yet when it came down to it, Peter's bravado melted away. He denied his Lord three times while Jesus was on trial. Though he did not hand Jesus over to the religious leaders like Judas, it was no less a betrayal. Peter disowned his Savior to save himself pain and struggle. After the resurrection, Peter recommitted his life to his Lord. He still was not perfect. We find this example when he was rebuked by Paul for not associating with non-Jewish Christians. That account can be found in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. Reminded to live like Christ, Peter corrected his behavior. Peter's walk as a believer was one of growth, facing his sins, repenting, and growing. He put his faith in the right place in his Savior, Jesus Christ, and grew close in character to his Savior. The world today wants nothing to do with sorrow. It is drowned out. They want nothing, thus they drowned it out. Maybe some of you can identify with it. 
You drowned out your sorrow with busyness. If I stay busy enough, I don't have to think about it. Music, therapists, even medication. If it makes me sad, it must be bad. It's a mantra that many use and live by. Which we seem to go to by default. But sorrow can be beneficial. It is not always a bad thing. Paul writes to us in Corinthians that though he did initially, he does not regret having caused them sorrow. Just the verse before the one we read this morning. Because they were made sorrowful to the point of repentance, according to the will of God, as our verse today tells us. Our verse today makes it clear that there is a kind of sorrow that is according to the will of God. Yes, there is a sorrow that is according to the will of God. And God wants you to experience that sorrow. Because the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation as the second half of our verse this morning tells us. Paul is teaching the Corinthians that an essential component of true repentance is genuine sorrow over having grieved God and belittling His holiness. One of the most common definitions of repentance is a change of mind. That is its literal etymological definition of the New Testament Greek word for repentance. Meta, change, noeo, to think, to change your thinking. But some take that to mean that repentance is nothing more than an intellectual alteration an acknowledgement that you have sinned and the commitment to think differently about it from now on. Sounds like something you'd read in the paper or on Facebook. But the mind is changed and the mind that is being changed in repentance in reference to both the Old and the New Testament for the term is in relationship to our heart. And the mind and the heart, the way my grandmother would put it, is every fiber of your being. Folks, the greatest distance in the world is the 18 inches from our mind to our heart. There are people who attend church every Sunday and act ungodly on Monday. Because what they hear and what they read has nothing to do with how they behave. How we behave comes from the heart. How we speak comes from the heart. From the heart overflows our words. So we need to be in God's word. We need to understand what it means to have godly sorrow, not just worldly sorrow. So repentance begins with an, does begin with an intellectual recognition and confession of sin. I intellectually recognize what I am doing is wrong and I agree with God that it's wrong. But it does not end there. There is also a change of heart, an emotional component in which the genuine believer mourns over having sinned against the God who loves them. That is why the classic psalm of repentance Psalms 21, 
David says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. The person who is truly repentant is not unmoved by their sin as if it's just no big deal. Oh, sorry, God broke another one of your laws again. Sorry about that. I'm so glad you're so gracious. A flippant attitude and a state of arrogance comes from a heart of pride. No. If you are truly repentant, you apprehend the offense of your sin to God, that it is against God that you have sinned. A God so good as to deliver his only begotten son to death in your place. A God so patient with you that despite the fact that you continue to sin, he continues to love you. When you understand that you have sinned against that gracious God, the only proper response is sorrow. To have a broken spirit and a contrite heart. It is that broken spirit and contrite heart that motivates you to change course and to return to God in faithfulness. John Calvin writes, This is careful to be observed, for unless the sinner is dissatisfied with himself, detests his manner of life, and be thoroughly grieved from an apprehension of sin, he will never betake himself to the Lord. One Puritan famously, famously stated, Till sin is bitter, Christ will never be sweet. Genuine repentance is a matter of the heart. That is why Jesus pronounces a blessing upon those who mourn over their sin. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 4. Because it is only those who feel the shame of their sin, who feel the offense it is to the holiness of God, and mourn over it, that turn from it in genuine repentance and seek forgiveness by the grace of God and are comforted by the God who does not despise a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Sorrow can be beneficial, but not always. While those who are genuinely repentant will experience sorrow over their sin, sorrow itself is not repentance. There is a kind of sorrow over sin that does not produce repentance and therefore does not lead to salvation. Again, in our verse today, Paul identifies this kind of sorrow as the sorrow of the world, which produces death. The chief characteristic of worldly sorrow is that it is fundamentally self-centered. Worldly sorrow revolves around the pain that sin causes to me rather than the offense and dishonor that it causes to God. Listen to the words of Philip Hughes in describing worldly sorrow. It is not sorrow because of the heinousness of sin as our rebellious action against God, but sorrow because of the painful and unwelcomed consequences of the sin in our life. Sin is self, is its central point. People who have worldly sorrow are often defensive about their sin. They attempt to justify it and explain it away. Whereas those who express godly sorrow 
own their sin and make no excuses for it. The question is, since all of us deal with sin regularly and all of us have sin in our lives, which one do you most identify with? Are you defensive? Are you explaining it away? Are you in a position that God has placed someone in your world who cares more about your relationship with a holy God than they even care about the friendship between the two of you? That they are willing to point out that sin in gentleness, in kindness, and in clarity? Do you express defensiveness? Do you explain it away? Or do you recognize that sin before a holy God and thank God for bringing that person at that time or his word at that time confronting you with that sin? Will you have a worldly sorrow? Will you have sorrow about it at all? And when you do, will it be a worldly sorrow? Or will it be a godly sorrow? You know you are expressing worldly sorrow when you are grieving for yourself. For the embarrassment your suffering, and your pain. And for the pain that you're feeling, how uncomfortable you feel. Rather than mourning over the grief you have brought to the Holy Spirit for dishonoring the grace of Christ and belittling the glory of God. This brings us back to Judas. It is said of Judas that he felt remorse for betraying Christ, that he returned the 30 pieces of silver by which he was bribed, and that he even openly confessed in Matthew 27, 3, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. At this point, Judas' actions are nearly indistinguishable from genuine repentance. He confessed his sin, he felt remorse for his sin, and he changed his actions. But ultimately, we learned this was not godly sorrow leading to repentance, but worldly sorrow that produces death. How do we know this? Because when the chief priests and elders would not take back the money, he threw the, Matthew 27, 5 says, he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed and he went away and hanged himself. If Judas was mourning over the offense he had committed against the Son of God, if his grief was fundamentally God-centered, his response would have looked much different. He knew. From walking with Christ for more than three years, he knew that he could have found forgiveness and restoration in Christ. Judas knew that Jesus had come to die for liars and traitors just like him. And that forgiveness was available to those who would abandon their sin and trust in Christ for righteousness. But that wasn't Judas's concern. His grief was fundamentally self-centered. 
He could not bear the shame and humiliation of having betrayed the Son of God. And rather than bring that shame to the Savior, who could pay for it, he sought to atone for his own sins by suicide. Worldly sorrow produces death. The instinct of worldly sorrow is to try to atone for sin by brooding over it and by feeling so bad for yourself that you are reduced to despair that there is no way out and no way through. But the instinct of godly sorrow is to run to the cross. The cross of Christ where the only atonement for sin was ever made. True repentance does not stop even with godly sorrow, but issues in a changed life. Genuine repentance bears fruit. And we see this as Paul details it with the Corinthians. Repentance consists in, as 2 Corinthians 7, 11 tells us, for see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, What punishment? At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in this matter. From this description, we can glean several characteristics by which we can assess whether our repentance is genuine. True repentance is marked by earnestness. Paul writes, for beloved, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. Earnestness refers to the Corinthians' eagerness to change their course and to restore their relationship with Paul. This is also expressed by the final three words, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. Genuine when repentance is not apathetic towards sin. Eh, it doesn't bother me. Teaching in a high school classroom for over 30 years, I would have students who would look at me and they would, the kids would be talking about some of the latest slasher movies. And undoubtedly, they would go, Mr. Garrison, what do you think? And I go, I don't watch those. And every time, the response was always, oh, they don't bother me. And I always responded with, I know, and I'm sorry. We get to a point where our sin doesn't even bother us. What we read, what we listen to, what we watch, what conversations we have doesn't bother us. Every one of you understand and have remember There were multiple times in Scripture where Jesus healed the leper. Do you understand what leprosy is? Leprosy is a disease of the nervous system. I can no longer feel. I'm walking along in a pair of sandals. I get a thorn in my toe, and I don't even know it's there. It festers, it grows. So with sin in my life, I don't even notice it's there. So when Jesus gave lepers back the ability to feel, 
he healed them of their leprosy, they could hurt again. Oh, for the heart to hurt as God hurts. For me to see my sin the way God sees it. That I would confess that sin before a holy God who loves me and repent of that sin. It is not indifferent about making it Genuine repentance is not indifferent about making restitution or restoring a relationship that has been damaged by sin. People who are truly repentant don't need to be badgered into seeking forgiveness. They don't need to be congealed into pursuing reconciliation. They don't need to be coerced into making changes in their lives that will ensure that no provision is made for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Genuine repentance beholds the seriousness of sin and is eager to deal with it biblically. Second, True repentance is marked by a desire to be known for righteousness. Paul next exclaims, what vindication of yourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. True repentance is marked by a desire to clear your name of the stigma of your sin. Wait a minute. Isn't that a part of worldly sorrow? I want to get out from the burden of the problem of this sin? Yes. But its motive is completely different. The motive of genuine sin is a yearning to have a reputation for righteousness rather than for iniquity. And how do you do that? You conduct yourself so that everyone who knew of your sin now knows that you have put off your unrighteousness and that you have been putting on the appropriate fruit of the Spirit in its place. If your sin was gossip, you now endeavor to be known as one who seeks truth and never evil of another. If your sin was impatience towards someone, you now go out of your way to show them grace. You desire to be known for righteousness because you bear the name of the righteous one and desire to bring no reproach upon God's reputation. Repentance is marked by an indignation. Those who repent of sin are rightly angry with themselves for having sinned against God. This is a natural effect of godly sorrow, but it's more intense. Calvin writes, the first step is that evil be displeasing to us. The second is that being inflamed with anger, we press hard upon ourselves so that our conscience may be touched to the quick. Charles Hodge adds, this is one of the most marked experiences of every sincere penitent. The unreasonableness, the meanness, the wickedness of his conduct rouses his indignation. He desires to seek vengeance on himself. Not the way the world would see this. Vengeance on ourselves being that desire to be known for righteousness, that desire to come back and to remove how we have drugged God's name through the dirt.
The repentant person does not coddle himself with positive thinking. Oh, that's okay. We all make mistakes. Oh, that's okay. Others are worse. We don't justify our sin. We claim it. We acknowledge it. And then we confess it before a holy God and repent of it. Repentance is a concerned with God esteem. Or as Paul puts it, the fear of God rather than one's self esteem. Reverence for God and his wounded honor dominates the affections of the one whose repentance is genuine. Finally, true repentance is marked by making things right. Paul concludes with, in everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in this manner. This does not mean that they had not been guilty, but that they had been, that they had bore the fruit, the, the fruit in keeping with repentance that they had made things right and could no longer be held to blame for the sin they had committed. This is the fruit of genuine repentance. An eagerness and a zeal, not a reluctance, to demonstrate a changed life to all those affected by one's sin. An indignation with oneself and their sin, born out of the utmost reverence for God rather than for ourselves or what other people think of us, a longing for the restoration of any relationship damaged by that sin, and a genuine concern that justice would be upheld as sin is disciplined and dealt with biblically. Be sure to examine whether your repentance is marked by these biblical characteristics. It is clear that the Bible does not leave us to wonder if we are experiencing worldly sorrow or godly sorrow. Peter and Judas are both struggled with sin throughout their time with Jesus during his earthly ministry, one with pride and one with greed. They both sat at his feet, witnessed his miracles, and learned about the kingdom of heaven. On the night of Passover, both chose to betray Jesus. Judas handed the rabbi over to the religious leaders for financial gain. Peter denied his affiliation with the man he called Lord. What made the difference between these two is one saw Jesus, as Christ, Jesus Christ as his Savior, and the other failed to see who his Savior was and died without faith or hope, or a chance at redemption. Both betrayed their Lord, but only one demonstrated godly repentance. It is important to understand from the life of Judas that it is not enough to see Jesus as a wise man who has ni had nice ideas about loving your neighbor and doing the right thing. Jesus made bold claims about himself ones that were suppo supported before the crucifixion with miracles and of healing, feeding the hungry, and resurrecting the dead. Judas saw all of these things firsthand, but could not call Jesus Lord. Today, the written record of the Bible testifies not only to these miracles, but to his resurrection Judas could not bring himself to put his faith in Jesus Christ, which ultimately led to his downfall. While Judas appears to be the same as the other apostles on the inside, he could not put his faith in Jesus Christ. Peter put his faith in his Lord. Though on the outset he appeared to struggle with outward sins, and Jesus asserted that Peter did not always understand his teachings. He understood 
what the Holy Spirit revealed to him and followed his Lord even after he betrayed Jesus by denying him and not standing up for him at the trial. He came back. He expressed godly repentance and did better moving forward. This example is one for Christians to follow today. Answer the call from God to follow him. And then go to him during the good times and the hard times. Sin and mistakes will happen, but God is ready to forgive. Two men, two betrayals, two different outcomes with only one lesson. Jesus is Lord and stands ready to forgive us if we will come to him in faith and in godly repentance. And now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. You'll close with me in prayer. Thank you, Father, for who you are. Thank you for all that you have done. Father, I pray that every person in this room recognizes now the difference between what the world identifies as repentance and what you identify as repentance. The world is, has been, and always will be self-centered. It's all about me. God, I pray that you would transform our depraved minds and our depraved hearts to bring us in relationship with you, to grow us in a process of sanctification, to become more like your son, and that we truly see godly repentance in our hearts, that we desire to change and willing to see the fruit of that repentance. And that, Father, we recognize that it's all about you. Help us to honor and glorify you in all that we do and in all that we say. And bring us back again safely next week. In your precious, gracious, and holy name. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.